Perfect. Oh, hello there. Today, you'll like the video. There's bad quality now, but I need to get over there, of Henry VIII. So this one is going to be exciting. Between his many wives and his excommunication, even the creation of the Church of England, we are going to dive into it right now. So Henry VIII really left his mark on history. We've all heard of Anne Boleyn, we've heard of the Church of England, and many more significant events that happened under this king. You see him right there, he's on his bed, he's drooling. This king is what we're going to be, be watching and learning about. Since I don't want to give too much away, I'm going to start the video here in just a second. It's a longer one, let me warn you. This one in general is 26 minutes, but these are massively entertaining. I love how these guys do it. It's oversimplified as the channel, and there's so much, so many jokes, so many funny things they add in there. Historical events that will weave through this timeline with Henry VIII that you may have never connected before, never knew about, and this is what we are all about. We are here to learn, we're here to discuss, and we're here to add on anything that we can to this video. So without further ado, let's jump into this and let's see what we learn. Since it's a longer video, I'll try to stop it minimally, but Henry VIII is just so bizarre, his, his rule, that it might just be hard to skip by things. So I'm going to address them. I'm going to gawk at them. I'm going to laugh. And these are the many reasons why we all heard of Henry VIII. Blah, Sigmund. I don't have much longer. Tell me, was I a good king? Uh, you were okay. Will I be remembered as the great warrior king who invaded France, revolutionized English healthcare, and developed great parklands? Um, probably not. Because of the wife killings? Because of the wife killings. Sigmund, how did I get here? I still remember the good old days when I was a boy with a heart full of fire and mummy would teach me. Okay, Henry, this is a horse. Can you say horse? Ho, ho, divorce. What? Ooh. No. Okay, let's try this one. Can you say loaf of bread? L loaf with her head. No, Henry, that's wrong. You know what, last one. Okay, can you say soap? Soap. S s yes, that's it. I'm the supreme head of the church. Screw the Pope! You know what? You're my son and I love you, but you're freaking weird, man. <laughs> Here we go. That's just the beginning. Here we go. The year is 1491. All England right. has just come out of three decades of civil war in which a bunch of Henrys, Edwards, and one Richard had a little ding-dong over which royal house should rule the realm. Finally, mm -hmm. a Henry won, Henry VII, and he had a son. What should we name him? My royal lineage is full of Henrys, a fine name, a vigorous name, a tenacious name, a muscular name. How about Arthur? And so Arthur, Prince of Wales and next in line to the throne, was born. Five years later, Prince Henry was born, but nobody cares about him. He's not the heir, just a spare. The king wanted to make an alliance with Spain, so one day he said to his son Arthur, hey, baby, you see that lady baby? That's gonna be your wife. But father, I'm not even three years old yet. Listen, there's something you have to understand. You're my son. But more than that, you're a political bargaining tool. But yep. you love me, right? I love you as a political bargaining tool. Yay. Hey, Pop, who the heck are you? I've written you a poem. Listen here, tiny man. Can't you see that I'm busy, but I'm your son. I have another son? As Arthur was in another palace, being prepped to become king, Henry lived with his mother and two sisters at Eltham, where he was being trained for a church career. And not just that, Henry learnt languages. He played sports. He learnt the recorder. What a nerd. Am I right? Wrong. Henry was the coolest kid around. So I told my Latin teacher he could kiss us my buddy us. <laughs> anyway, here's Wonderwall. Yeah. Great scholars and theologians from across Europe came to meet and teach the young Prince Henry, who by all accounts was a very enlightened, bright and charming young boy. Everybody loved Henry. Seems and good out of so far. everything Henry was taught, more than anything, he came to adore and respect theology and Catholicism. One of Henry's tutors was English poet laureate John Skelton, who wrote a textbook for Henry that we still have today. In it, he wrote a number of important lessons for the young prince, such as, do not be mean, loathe gluttony, and do not violate widows. Important lessons for any nine-year-old boy. 
Around this time, Henry's older brother Arthur, now 15 years old, was married to Catherine of Aragon, sealing the union between England and Spain. And then he died. Oh, my alliance with How? Spain. My poor, poor alliance with Spain. And your son, sire? Oh, yes, of course, my son. But mostly my alliance with Spain. Hey, Pop, who the heck are you? Oh, yeah! And just like that, an unprepared Prince Henry was now the new heir to the throne. And how about that alliance with Spain? Well, the solution was simple. Hey, boy, see that full-grown woman over there? That's gonna be your wife. What, my brother's widow? Yes. You're a freaking weirdo, man. Now, in the Bible, there's a verse that says marrying your brother's widow, that's a big no-no. So the king needed to convince the Pope and get his special permission. Hey, can I please have my son marry his brother's widow? Eh, sure, why not? And so it was. Henry's life was turned on its head as he was moved- What happened to his first son? What happened to Henry's brother? And how young was he? I mean, he got married when he was 15. Did it happen when he was 15? When it happened five years later, 10 years later? So many questions. Moved to the royal court, next in line to the throne. But tragedy struck when just a few months later, his mother, with whom he was very close, suddenly died in childbirth. The loss of his mother almost wow. certainly had a big effect on the young boy. In his older years, King Henry VII went on a bit of a paranoid trip. As was normal for a king at the time, Henry VII had had to quell a number of rebellions. And as he aged, he became ever more suspicious of the nobility around him. To keep them in check, he began levying huge, ruinous fines, left, right, and center. Dukes, bishops, barons, even his own mother. No one was safe from his tyranny. And the nobility of England Yikes. began to suffer. It begins. So when Henry VII finally got sick and died just after Christmas 1508, there was a lot of celebration. Not only because the tyrannical Henry VII was gone, but because his replacement was the ever-popular, charming, and handsome 18-year-old King Henry VIII. Henry married Catherine of Aragon in June 1509. You may be wondering, if it's so weird to marry your brother's widow, and since he's now king, couldn't Henry just decide not to? Well, yes, he could. But by now, Henry wanted to. The thing about Henry that was unlike many kings of the time was he married for love. And he had grown quite fond of Catherine, very fond. Historians mm -hmm. say their marriage was unusually good. And so he was coronated king. And what a king. Compared to his tyrannical father, he was an absolute joy. Having the blood of two royal houses, he was widely supported. He was really, really ridiculously good looking. And those famous calves could achieve world peace. Hey Henry, now that you're king, you know what that means. Costume party! Henry pranced around the palace playing dress up with his friends. He wrote plays. He sang songs. He danced. A true renaissance man, very different from the gluttonous wife killer we think of today. In his early reign, people from near and far would come to ask favors of the generous king. Hey man, could I gain ownership of some land near Upton Snodsbury? Sure thing, pal. Hey, could I be an earl or a baron or a viscount or something? Anything you want, man. Could I get like, just like a really cool pig that has like freaking metal wings and eight legs and shoots flipping lasers and it can grow more pigs out of it for extra pigs? Say no more. Hey, guys, I was just checking up on the financial Yikes. report and what the hell? We can't afford this. Henry's council that he inherited from his father weren't happy with all the money he was just throwing around. This seems like a common theme a lot of times with just monarchs in general throughout history. Seems like his education was good. I mean, from the start of the video, it seems like he had people coming in from all over teaching him, perhaps since he didn't have, you know, parental figures later in life. You know, he's only 18 here. There's no role model perhaps for him, and he maybe thinks he's above everyone else to listen to him. I'm not sure what's going on here, but it's it's beginning to look, it's, it's beginning to turn here. And they worked hard to curb the king's spending. Since they controlled the royal seals needed to get stuff done, at first they were largely able to control the young king. And for Henry, the most infuriating things of all was they wouldn't let him jest with his friends because it was too dangerous, nor would they let him do the thing he wanted most, to go on a great, glorious, and expensive conquest against England's historic enemy, France. Please guys, Naturally. I'll keep it cheap. Sexy calves, excessive spending, and war with France. 
Henry wanted glory. He wanted to go down in history. If he didn't go to war in France, was he even the King of England? Man, I want to go to war so bad, but the council won't let me. Hey, maybe I can help with that. Whoa, it's Cardinal Wolsey. One of my best friends, despite being an old ass man, Cardinal Wolsey knew that if he helped King Henry, there'd likely be something in it for him. So what was his great, intricate plan to curb the council's power? You're the king, dum-dum. You can do whatever you want. What? Wolsey began writing bills that simply didn't require the seals, and thus, Henry was back on top. For his efforts, uh -oh. Wolsey began to climb the ranks, and he became something of a yes-man for King Henry, encouraging Henry to frolic mm -hmm. and play while Wolsey took care of business. <laughs> hey, kid, you wanna go on an adventure? Do I ever? The Pope was at war with France, and he needed some help. He offered the young, impressionable King Henry 100 Parmesan cheeses, some wine, and a golden rose if he came to the Pope's aid, and Henry was all in. At this point in his life, he still respected the church and loved the Pope, and here was the chance for war he had been waiting for. He still didn't have an heir, a fairly big problem for a monarch at the time, but right now, the only kind of smashing he was interested in was smashing French guys in the face. And so off he went. The English he got an open door from the church to go to war with their mortal enemies. And he definitely took that very fast. He probably heard that like, yes, finally, we're doing it. We have a we have a reason to go to war. It's looking looking darker and darker for them. English already held the French city of Calais. From there, Henry made a glorious victory at the Battle of the Spurs. He took the French cities of Terouan and Tournai. Word of his victory spread. This was it. Here was the glory he had been waiting for. Back home, his beautiful wife also led armies to victory in Scotland. And better yet, she was pregnant. Soon, Henry would have an heir. All of Henry's wildest dreams were coming true. Oh, he ran out of money. As the French prepared to invade Italy, all Henry could do was go home. Well, at least now I have an heir to cheer me up. Bring me my son. Henry, this is Mary. Mary? That's a funny name for a boy. Henry, it's a girl. Ah! This was Catherine's uh -oh. fifth pregnancy that had not... Re Dang, so first one, girl, stillborn. Boy, died. Boy, died. Boy, stillborn. Don't they have a theory nowadays that it was... King Henry is, you know, after going through so many wives, King Henry was the actual one to cause this to not create an heir. It was on his side of things. St statistics show that would probably be the case, right? Resulted in a male heir. Happy Henry wasn't so happy anymore. You still haven't given me a male heir. Well, how do you know it's my problem? Maybe it's your problem, Henry. It couldn't be my problem because I've been boinking half your maid staff and one of them gave me a boy, uh, I mean, sure. Yeah, you know what? Maybe it's my problem. I'll look into that. Cardinal Wolsey, now Henry's Lord Chancellor, knew his job depended on keeping Henry happy. And so he said, well, if you can't be the great warrior, then how about the great peacemaker? Not as cool, but okay. And so the field of the cloth of gold, a glamorous peace summit between England and France was held. The King of France, Francis I, was essentially the French version of King Henry. And the whole thing was basically one giant cod piece measuring contest. The two sides did agree to a peace treaty, However, it didn't last long. You see, there was a third major player in European politics at the time, an exquisite specimen of royal inbreeding, an heir to a huge inheritance, and a chin that could hit a home run. Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. He was Henry's wife's nephew. Henry had helped him out in the past to put down right. a Spanish rebellion, and now the two wanted to make an alliance, and so a marriage was arranged. Mary, I'd like to introduce you to your 22-year-old fully grown adult cousin, and now your future husband. Ew, he looks inbred. Mary! We're all inbred. With their new alliance, Charles and Henry agreed to team up and relaunch a campaign against France. In 1522, the English landed and stormed as far south as Agincourt, but Charles didn't commit significant forces. Whoops, sorry man, not sure what happened. I'll join in next year. The next year, England swept northern France, almost taking Paris. But once again, wow. where was Charles? Bar. Oh man, I'm so sorry. I promise, next year, I'll be there. The next year came, and a fed up Henry decided he was going to sit this one out. And just as Charles ravaged the French at the Battle of Pavia and captured the French king. Holy crap, dude. Yeah, I totally kicked France's butt. That's great. So, can I have the French throne like we agreed? Hmm. No. What? And also, I don't want to marry your ugly daughter anymore. It, ugly? Have you seen your chin? Mummy says it's a strong chin for a strong boy. I need to look up a picture of this guy and see if it's actually true.
Does he have a really big chin? That is the question. But furthermore, he captured the French king, which is huge. You know, they have all, so much leverage now. And this alliance does not seem overly strong in general. It looks like it's not going anywhere right now. So I'm going to be curious to see what happens between this alliance. As Henry's alliance with Charles fell apart, Henry knew his go. days as a warrior were over. This was a problem for Henry, but it was a bigger problem for his wife. Catherine of Aragon had two jobs. The first was to give Henry a male heir, but the second was to maintain an alliance with her relatives in Spain, including her nephew. She had failed, and Henry's sexy eyes began to wander. Home from all his wars, oh. Henry ate up his daily 5,000 calories of meat as an infatuation began to grow for one of his wife's ladies-in-waiting, Anne Boleyn. Beautiful, intelligent, cultured. She was exactly Henry's type. Now, Henry had had dozens of mistresses, including Anne's sister, but Anne didn't want to just be Henry's side chick. She wanted to be his queen. Henry sent dozens of letters, thirsty love poems. In one, he proclaimed that he would like to kiss her pretty duckies. Henry's loins were on fire, but Anne kept him at just the right distance to drive him crazy and push him to find a way to get rid of his current wife. Wolsey, I want a divorce. And as the representative of the Pope here in England, I expect you to sort it out quickly and quietly. It's not gonna go well. I don't want this to turn into a Europe-wide scandal. You got it, your majesty. Hey, Big Papa! My boy Henry says he wants to divorce his wife. Any chance? To Henry's shock and horror, Wolsey deferred the case back to the Pope in Rome. To make matters worse, after all the wars in Europe, the Pope was currently under the thumb of Charles V. Now everybody knew what was going on, and Henry's divorce trial had become a pawn of greater European politics. For Wolsey, the decision was a disaster. His job was to keep Henry happy, and Henry was very, very unhappy. Nevertheless, the divorce trial began. Henry's case rested upon the Bible verse in Leviticus that claimed marrying your brother's widow would lead to childlessness, and Henry was certainly having a hard time getting a male heir. He argued that the Pope had got it wrong when he allowed Henry to marry his brother's widow, and that now divorce was the only solution. He's really pulling out all the stops to make this happen. He's committed. However, the Pope and Charles V acquired some interesting letters from an unknown source. He wants to kiss her pretty duckies? Man, this guy's loins are on fire. The Pope now knew the case for divorce may not actually be found in Henry's Bible, but in Henry's pants. After escaping Charles V, the Pope did send out one Cardinal Campaggio to oversee the trial. Campaggio was an old man racked with gout. It took him six painful months to travel from Rome to England, and when he finally got there, this kept happening. Hey, I need you to take a look at this evidence. I can't, my gout is acting up. Hey, are you ready to take my testimony? I can't, my gout is acting up. Hey, can you please make a decision? I can't, your gout is acting up, my gout is acting up. Anne Boleyn, with her Protestant views and support of the Reformation, suspected the Pope was just delaying. For two whole years, the trial dragged on and on, and in the end, the Pope simply said, no, no Pretty divorce duckies. for you. Henry, the king that had previously defended the Pope militarily from France and intellectually from the reformist ideas of Martin Luther, who had once respected the Pope above all, now found the Pope standing between him and fourth base. Your Majesty, what will you do? I'm the king, dum-dum. I can do whatever I want. What? For his failure, Henry removed Wolsey from the court, a decision that was likely influenced by Anne Boleyn, who disliked the cardinal. Having fallen from grace and with potential charges of treason over his head, Wolsey died of illness a year later. Then, Henry set about removing England from the influence of the Pope. Hey, if you do that, I'll excommunicate you. Who cares, man? Oh no, apathy. My weakness. Henry gathered theologians and scholars together to help him make his case against the Pope. Together, they argued to the people of England that the Pope's rule over the church was basically a takeover of what had once been a self-governing national English church. And if that sounds familiar, some historians do believe this moment may have laid the foundations for English Euroscepticism. That's right, Brexit may have been influenced by Henry's explosive loins. By and large, the people gave Henry their support, and those that didn't were going to be in for a that's over my head because I don't know too much about Brexit in general. Let me know what you think. But it's starting to turn. The Church of England is brewing right here. The idea is forming. So we can get a divorce and move on to one of his next many wives, Anne Boleyn. A rough time. But for now, Henry assumed the role of supreme head of the English church. And his next divorce trial was a foregone conclusion. Catherine of Aragon was Aragon. And Anne Boleyn was in.
All right, I've upended the entire country to be with you, so you'd better give me a son, okay? Now, did you get my letter about the duckies? Having finally married the girl of his dreams, it was party time for Henry. And what a party. Life in the Tudor court was non-stop. Huge banquets, with each person eating on average 5,000 calories a day. And no vegetables. Those are for poor people. Rich people ate meat. And so you know what else is for rich people? Constipation. But don't let that stop the party. The toilets are communal. And Henry himself was the center of everything. He ate the best food. He had 1,200 pairs of shoes. He didn't even have to wipe his own bum bum. Life was great. Everyone, I give you your majesty, King Henry VIII. But how did they the pay for skills. it all? Well, influenced by his fairly Protestant new wife, since Henry had overturned the organization of the church, this is how they paid for it. Oh my goodness, how awful. Selling fake fragments of the cross? Vials of Jesus' blood that you got from a duck? Using religion in this way? This is terrible. I must confiscate all this money at once. Yes, how awful. I must take all of this away immediately. Was King Henry VIII ever good like building up to his 18th birthday or until he was 23 whatever it was was he ever in like heavy favor of the people it seems like he started off everyone loved him because he really didn't mess up anything even the war his original war with france when he teamed up with the holy roman empire was a success he got a couple wins kind of pushed in a little bit then he came back his wife was doing work in scotland pushing them and it seems like that was kind of like the peak before everything turned and kind of went much more downhill he's ever sliding down this hill from this moment oh, actually it's been a while a couple minutes now he's been sliding down in fact since those wins in my opinion he's been sliding monasteries across the nation were dissolved and their riches placed in the royal coffers Obviously, many people weren't too happy about this, but Henry had a plan for that as well. Henry's descent into tyranny had begun, as any who rejected his new claim as supreme head of the English church found their heads on the chop. Good thing they did not have the French guillotine at this time, because that got crazy. This same channel has the video of the French Revolution, and the guillotine was the execution method in favor of everyone. It was, it was what was in at the time. So good thing they didn't have this right here, or else it possibly could have been much worse. Block. And so Henry partied. He danced. He sang. He ate. He jousted. Be me. Love gluttony. Oh no. Violate widows! This is it. In 1536, Henry fell from his horse in a jousting accident. Not for the first time, but certainly the heaviest fall he had taken yet. Some historians believe the brain damage caused by the incident may have violently accelerated Henry's descent into tyranny. Executions in England ramped up. During his reign, it's estimated 57 to 72,000 people were put to death. Rich or poor, Crazy. big or small, no one was safe. And the most prominent victim of all was to be Henry's own wife. It had been three years since their marriage. Anne had been pregnant four times, yet she had only been able to produce one healthy child, a girl. What's more, it's possible she had been going around insulting Henry's manhood. Henry's eyes, once again, began to wander. His new top man, Thomas Cromwell, didn't want to end up like Cardinal Wolsey, and so he came up with a plan. There was a court musician who had been quite flirtatious in public with the Queen. Well, Thomas Cromwell and his boys got a forced confession out of him, saying that it didn't stop at innocent flirtation, and the charges came rolling in. Listen, Anne, we need to talk. Oh no, you're gonna divorce me, aren't you? Just like your last wife. Oh, n no, come here, shh, no. I'm not gonna divorce you. It's much worse than that. Anne was charged mm -hmm. with adultery, perversion, even incest, and plotting to kill the king himself. The jury found her guilty, including her own uncle and ex-fiancé, both fearing the wrath of the king. And on May 19th, 1536, Anne Boleyn was Anne Bullout. Literally the next day, Henry married one of Anne's ladies-in-waiting, Jane Seymour, his third wife. After Anne had smack-talked his manhood, and since he still had no male heir, Henry went on a campaign to ensure the public knew he was as virile as it gets. He had this famous portrait painted of the manliest man I've ever seen, and later, he would even have his physician make a declaration about his health. King Henry is a fine specimen of a man, and... Ugh, please don't make me say this. Say it. <sighs> and every time I look at him, 
I wish I was a woman. The truth is, after his jousting accident, the king had badly injured his leg and was no longer very active, yet he was still eating his daily 5,000 calories. So by now, Henry was extremely unhealthy. For the remainder of his life, he would incur a number of illnesses, and his injured leg ulcers would ooze stinking pus. A fine specimen of a man indeed. On the church front, Indeed. Henry's new and now pregnant wife was a devout Catholic, and she pleaded with the king to reinstate the monasteries. Henry was sick of wives meddling in his business, and he bluntly warned her to remember what happened to Anne Boleyn. Since splitting with the Pope, Crazy. Henry had been hard at work determining the theology of his new Church of England. It kept many Catholic traditions, while on the other hand embracing some reformist ideas, such as requiring the use of a new Bible, not in Latin, but in English. The cover of Henry's new Bible depicted the people appearing to worship a giant King Henry. And in the corner, there's some people being put to death, just for good measure. For any who opposed Henry's ideas, whether Catholic or Protestant, for any who rebelled against him, it would be off with their heads. In October... Do people even have that book still? I know this was quite a while ago, but I bet that is... it, it should be in a museum somewhere. Is that cover, it really shows kind of his state of mind at the time. He's in the middle, there's people in prison, like watch out. Don't go against me, he's saying. That fall off the horse during the jousting match really triggered him, like put him off. On, he was already going in the wrong direction, a bad direction, then it really shot down right after that. 1537, Henry finally got what he had been waiting for. His wife Jane gave birth to a healthy boy. However, the triumph soon turned to tragedy as Jane Seymour died days later from complications during the birth. Henry mourned Jane, the woman who had given him a son for two years. Your Majesty, it's time to choose your next wife. Thomas, not now. Can't you see I'm in mourning? That one. The woman Thomas Cromwell had lined up for Henry's next marriage was the sister of a powerful German duke. But all Henry cared about was that she was pretty as pie, and Thomas Cromwell promised that indeed she was. However, when she arrived in England, Henry was less than pleased. Your Majesty, let me introduce you to your fourth wife, Anne of Cleves. Wh what's that smell? Uh, I think it's your leg, sire. No, it's Anne of Cleves. She's ugly. This is treason. What? Off? With his head, Henry found his new wife so repulsive that he never consummated the marriage and divorced her just six months later. And for bringing Henry an ugly, stinky woman, along with additional charges of plotting treason, Thomas Cromwell lost his head. I would like to see the real, you know, the, the reasons behind Cromwell and how he got to this point in general. I'm sure there's many things building up behind the scenes. This is, of course, massively simplified because it has to be. It's oversimplified after all. But I'd like to know if people really do believe. I, I would guess he, Henry was just going a little crazy at this time. He's chopping everyone's head off, it seems like, executing everyone around him. Even if he throws out a random guess of treason to someone around him. Or anyone he points to, it seems like. I'd like to know more of the backstory on Cromwell. And the charges. And if anyone nowadays could truly back up any of them. Or if it's just all a lie. Henry's going crazy. Ed. The very same day of Cromwell's execution, Henry married his fifth wife, the famed beauty, Catherine Howard. She's believed to have only been 17 at the time. Henry was 49. And like Anne of Cleves, Catherine Yikes. Howard didn't last long. You see, for some reason, she may not have been entirely satisfied with her 49-year-old fine specimen of a man. And it's possible she engaged in a number of extramarital affairs, including one with her cousin, Thomas Culpepper. When Henry found out, he was devastated. How could she do this to me? But sire, don't you have hundreds of mistresses? Shut up, Barry. That's not the point. <laughs> your majesty, you're crying. I'm not crying. It's just that sometimes when I get sad, water comes out of my eyes. For her treason, Catherine Howard met the same fate as Anne Boleyn in 1542. So we've had divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded. Look out. He Here we come to the sixth and final wife. I really don't know anything other than Anne Boleyn before this video and what happened exactly to all of his wives. Divorced, beheaded, died, divorced, beheaded. Naturally, I would assume died just in the progression of this, but I'm kind of thinking beheaded. Because why not? Probably a safe, safe bet. Were the ones that were beheaded, was it all always a public event? 
or is it more semi-public? There's some people there. I'd assume it's public for anyone to show up because that's terrifying. That brings a whole new terror to this. Here comes survived. Henry married the daughter of a royal official, Catherine Parr, in 1543, and she appears to have been a good companion to Henry. She cared for the aging king, who by now was so heavy it took several men to winch him onto his horse. She acted as a mediator within the family and convinced the king to restore his two daughters to the line of succession. Their marriage did have one hiccup, however, when Catherine dared disagree with the king over the subject of theology. It's a miracle because when the priest says the words of institution, the bread turns into the body of Christ. Well, if you put the bread in a box for three months, is it a miracle that it turns moldy? <gasps> Treason! You can't just call everything treason, Henry. The king called for her arrest as serious charges were placed over her head. However, in the end, she told Henry that she had not been disagreeing with him, but simply learning from him. And so when the guards came to arrest her, the king told them to make like an Anne and cleave. Catherine Parr stayed he with Henry that. right until the end. As he aged into his later years, in increasing pain and ill health, he grew ever more suspicious and moody. The once generous, promising young king was now feared by all around him. Sigmund, I don't have much longer. Hold me. Of course, sire. Do you have any final wishes? Uh, how, uh, how about... How about one last conquest in France? And so in 1544, Henry made for Calais. What? The pesky French had been supporting the Scottish in their ongoing no wars way. in England, and they also owed Henry some money. So the extremely unhealthy king personally led a siege against the French city of Boulogne. The English dug tunnels under the castle, and on the 13th of September, the French surrendered. A glorious victory for Henry. In actuality, the whole misadventure nearly bankrupt England, and they ended up giving Boulogne back to the French a few years later. But shh, don't tell Henry. He's having his moment. Finally, in 1547, a 55-year-old Henry, lapsing in and out of consciousness, passed away. His son, Edward, succeeded him, but died just five years later. His daughter, Mary, briefly took the reins and steered the country back towards the Pope. But then his second daughter embraced reformist ideas and gradually transformed England into a Protestant country. Henry's desperation to marry Anne Boleyn and his resulting feud with the Pope had changed the course of English history and religion forever. Unfortunately, none of Henry's children had heirs, and when Elizabeth I died, Henry's lineage ended, with the House of Stuart replacing the House of Tudor. So then you might think, all that effort, a life filled with so much frustration, yet he never conquered France, he barely had a male heir, and his lineage died out. Yeah, just thinking of that is crazy. All of his work, all of his beheadings and divorces amounted to nothing, really. It, it didn't really go anywhere. His line was wiped out, and I'm really thinking, because of him. It's not the woman, it's because of him. And maybe it's proven nowadays? I, I'm gonna look that up after this. The egotistical man Henry grew sick and cruel, and then died. So why are we all so fascinated with King Henry VIII? Why not Henry II or IV? Well, without mentioning the many important things his reign did achieve, one of his biggest goals was to go down in history. And you can put a big green check beside that one. Because everything he did, and how he asserted his control and authority over everyone around him, has come to be viewed as the epitome of the word king. And also because of the wife killings? Yeah, definitely the wife killings. <laughs> That was great. That was long. So if you made it, thank you. And I hope you learned something in there or at least reinforce things that you learned or added on to it all for that. I really tried to minimally stop it. It's a longer video. It's already really long. I just can't believe for his condition, he went to war with France. I thought they were joking. I thought that was another joke within this video. Just, you know, ha yeah, okay, whatever. And he did. He went to war, took some places, took some land, went back and died. That's just, it just shows what, after everything, what kind of person he was. Very much into his image and how people would view him when he died, when he's gone. What is he going to be like in history? And here we are, we all know him from the wife killings, of course and the Church of England. I feel like those are the two main ones. Of course, there's probably a, quite a few good things that he did, but they're so overshadowed by those, <laughs> the wife killings. I feel like you always go back to that. So my question to you, any British folk that are watching, what are your thoughts? What do you learn about Henry VIII in school or just in general? What do you learn about him? What do you know about him? And how do they teach about him? Do they show also on top of these bad things that he's done, 
do they also teach, you know, like the good things that he did? There has to be quite a few good things that he did for the people and for the country. Or is he known, like here for, in the U.S., we just know him about kind of those main topics that we already discussed. We in the U.S. mainly know him for the wife killings and, yes, once again, creating the Church of England. And that's kind of all the knowledge that we have and that he was a big unhealthy guy. Didn't know many of these things that I just watched, so I love that. And I, I'm just mainly curious to know what people living there think about him, what, what they learn about him. I need to change the screen. Boom. That's where it's always really enlightening to me, though. Always the discussions in it, what people know about him, how they learned about him. Little tidbits here and there that are very enlightening and eye-opening. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Since this is way too long, A, that was a good video. Gets a like from me, but two, Thanks for joining. Thanks for watching. I'll do my best to keep them shorter. There's like a few long videos out there that I want to do like this one, but the mass majority of them are, you know, 15 minutes or under, probably like five to 15 minutes. So we'll, we'll keep it there. So thanks for joining. Thanks for watching. Let me know what you think about Henry VIII and have a good rest of your day.